So uh, Kate also is going to talk about uh, about uh, international education and research related to a network that is established by is coordinated by Washu. Washu is the the way they they, they call the Washington University in San Luis. We call it Washu. So uh, just for us to understand that and this this uh, partnership between uh, that, uh, that is created by Washu will represent a great opportunity for Unicamp, particularly for graduate students to, to participate in this partnership, represents a great opportunity. Because when you join the partnership with Washu, you are joining uh, immediately with several other universities worldwide and in, in, in the fields of energy, environment, food security, public health, in issues that are more global than really um, local things. So we have the pleasure today to receive Professor Carter. Uh, I don't want to, to to use more time in this, so please uh, uh, come, please okay, stay right. here. And, uh, right. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. I think this is in order here. Two. Is this working? Say again. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, you, you also need. This. Ah, I understand. Sorry. Great. High technology. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I, I may move around a little bit, um, but let me just give you a quick sense of what I want to do today. I want this to be sort of a conversation. I want to give you an idea, a little bit of an overview of Washington University, some of the things we're trying to do there, and then uh, sort of why I'm here. So I think something special is happening in St. Louis. Um, as as uh, Professor Corsa said, I am from, uh, uh, I'm Associate Dean of Engineering there. I'm a professor of practice. I joined WashU only a few months ago, coming from Washington, D.C., where I had an appointment in the administration. Prior to that, I was at MIT. Um, and have moved around and settled in Washington, in, in Washington University in St. Louis for a few very specific reasons. Three questions that I, I think come in everyone's mind when they see someone stand up in front of them of who, who are you, what do you do, and why does it matter? So I've already told you who I am. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and, and, and why it matters. The first I'll say is, I'm sitting here right now, many of you know, or you think you have a definition of what an engineer is. And I ask myself that question regularly. What is an engineer? And I think you, we can dice it around your disciplines. We're electrical engineers, computer scientists, we're agricultural engineers, civil and environmental engineers, mechanical engineers. But I want to speak more broadly for just a moment about engineering. I think uh, if you look at nation, the uh, National Engineers Week, they say engineers turn ideas into reality. And I love that. Um, there's also an older definition that says engineering is the application of science to common, the common purpose of life. And I want this to be a conversation, so if, there's some, if, if I am speaking too fast, if I'm not understood, stop me. All right? I'd rather make sure we understand it than that I get through the slides. It'll be a conversation. And finally, it's, it's the ideal, ideal engineer is a composite. He or she is not a scientist, he or she is not a mathematician, not a sociologist or writer, but they may use all of that knowledge towards and, and techniques in solving problems. So it really is a problem solver. And you'll see that I've got hidden over here the summation of one to three uh, over those two, and that kind of comes up to, for me, it's people that ask the why question. And we look at asking the why questions in medicine, in public health, um, in policy, but it really is how do we take a set of people that have deep technical training uh, and want to apply that to the pursuit of tenure track uh, positions, to the pursuit of government and policy, the pursuit of law, medicine, any number of, of, of topics. But it really is about a rigor and, uh, and, a, and a willingness uh, to ask why and to fail fast and recover and continue to ask those kinds of questions. Right? So that's my, when I say engineering, that's where the, the direction from which I'm coming. So in my class, uh, my seminar, uh, my students get four rules. And those are the same, and, and this is a slide taken right from my seminar this semester. You have to do excellent work, you have to learn something, you have to have fun, and you have to make progress. I started a company in the UK about 10 years ago, and I had these same four rules for the people that work for me. Uh, the only difference is to make progress was make money. And uh, so, so progress and money, depending on how you define it, 
Uh, for the most part, I, ask, I say this because I think those four rules are what make for a happy engineer, happy student, a happy uh, member of the workforce, a uh, happy colleague in, in the university. So our mission is uh, to discover the unknown, educate students, develop leaders, and serve society. Those four, for the most, for the most part. Uh, it, it's that I, the focus on inquiry, focus on education, development and leadership, and service to society. Those are four very important tenets that I think emerge from those four rules that we, that we talked about. Doing excellent work in all those areas, learning something in those areas, having fun while doing it. Because if you're not having fun, th there are two ways to think about how you do things in life, as an investment and a tax. So if I came to Professor Cortez and I said, I have, I have two options for you. You can have uh, 100 real as, a, as an investment or 100 real as a tax. Either way, I'm taking 100 real from you. It just depends on how you feel about that. So as a tax, no one likes taxes, although they're very beneficial. But everyone likes investments, particularly good ones. From the perspective of the person sitting in the front chair, they're still out $100, but it's how that's being used. And what I hope is that, what I hope that each of you will do is think that your time here is an investment and not a tax. Right. Um, and you'll feel good about that. Quick facts, we have about 82 uh, tenure track faculty members in the School of Engineering. We're a, a private institution. Uh, our undergrads are just over, just uh, under 20, 1,200. Uh, master's and doctoral students together, probably around 700. So we're about a 1,900 uh, student institution in terms of undergrad and grad. If you look at our research expenditures from the NIH, we are the number one institution in research funding for the NIH. If you look at the focus uh, on research expenditure in other areas, particularly in engineering and basic science, we're about 25 million a year, and our alumni base is just under 20,000. So it's a really good profile for, for the institution. Uh, our departments are these, uh, biomedical engineering, all very, very well ranked programs. Uh, computer science and engineering, we actually just got a new department head there this year who came to us from, from Penn State, uh, from the uh, University of Pennsylvania. ESC, which is sort of my, uh, uh, my nominal home, my area is electrical engineering and, and systems. Uh, Energy, environment, and chemical engineering, this is a group that came in through McGeep a few years ago. Uh, mechanical engineering and material science. In fact, we just started a new interdisciplinary uh, PhD in material science. We have another program here, that's, uh, the UMSL Whistle Joint uh, Engineering Program. There's a, a, a public institution in our city that is, uh, uh, does not have an engineering school, and we've partnered with them for the last 15 years to make sure that, that students there can get a great engineering education uh, through a public-private partnership. So that's just uh, the fact. I don't know how your geography is of the U.S., but let me give you a quick, uh, a quick uh, primer. Get, let's get your bearings. Where are we? Well, so. Uh, here is St. Louis. This is a population density map of the U.S. Uh, here is where my home institution uh, originally was, uh, MIT Harvard here. Uh, this is I did my training. I did my first training in, at, at MIT. I finished my training at uh, Nova Southeastern University in, in Florida. I spent time in Washington uh, before that, batting back and forth between Washington and, and, and Boston, and then moved to this area, St. Louis. So if you don't know where, uh, if you didn't know before coming where WashU is, this is where it is. Uh, very close to Chicago. Washington University, University of Washington is in Seattle up here. George Washington University is over here. But the heart of the world is right here in, in St. Louis. A, a very, very, very wonderful place to, to be. And I'm not getting paid to say that. I think there are a few elements I'd like to make sure that you get before you leave today. Who are the people that make up WashU? Well, we look at the selectivity of the, of the students. Uh, you may be familiar with the standardized test, the SAT, which is used at the, in the United States. Of uh, the 6,200 applicants um, to the school, we took about 275 freshmen. Here's the breakdown. They come from 35 states and 10 countries. Um, and less than 10 of them came from, 10% come from the actual St. Louis area. So we are looking for a broad and diverse group of people to come. We're looking for some of the best minds to come solve some of the most challenging problems that we believe our time presents. Um, and they're sort of a quirky group. We've got uh, chemical engineers that won track awards. Uh, we've got a set of students who founded a, a low-cost spirometer company last year. I actually just saw them in the office uh, before leaving. Uh, this summer, they're doing extremely well. They start off with a small $25,000 competition. They've raised 
over 150 or so thousand dollars at this point, and they're actually going off to start a company. They just graduated as undergraduates, actually. Um, and then we've got a, a computer science student who loves to spend his time. You guys ever played with a Rubik's Cube? So anyone here can solve the Rubik's Cube in less than a minute, 40 seconds? Okay, if you could, then you might be in competition with Kevin, because uh, that's what he spends his spare time doing. The National Science Foundation, where I came from, has a set for outstanding faculty. They recognize them early in their career with a career award. Uh, over the last seven years, we've had a series of wonderful faculty members who've won career awards. And this is, and I take a moment just to sort of soak this up. This is not an easy award to get. Uh, we have 82, as I said, faculty members. And you can see the math here. Uh, of the 82, uh, 10 of them have been career award winners. Uh, that's the caliber of people that we're looking for in our, in our, to teach some of the best students that we can find. And they're across disciplines. New faculty members, uh, all fantastic people. You can exclude this guy over here. Uh, but these are people that have joined within the last couple of years. Uh, uh, I, as I said, I came on board as associate dean. And uh, it's really quite a privilege to be able to, to help lead this, this group of faculty. At Abigail and Andrew, I told you about Spiro Labs. I won't go into too much more of it. But they originally said, let's go to developing countries and let's figure out how to, to establish, uh, how to develop a, the ability to test for asthma and other chronic illnesses um, at a very low cost. So we can't pull in big uh, devices into, these, into developing villages. But what we can do is have something that's small and portable. Let's say it's under $8. Um, they, they, they stumbled onto something, and it's actually quite fun to see what they're doing with that. Um, another example is one of our PhD students, and uh, MD, MD-PhD students, Matthew McCann, who uh, just set up a, a company a few years ago looking at a nano mesh technology. I give you these two examples to say we think about engineering also as engineering in practice. If you're solving some of the most challenging problems that our, that our, our world has to present, uh, then often those solutions have, have impact beyond the laboratory, right? And they should have impact beyond the laboratory at some points. And these are two students, some in the undergraduate level, some at the master's level, and some at the PhD level. One of them, Matthew, cross-functioning uh, between the engineering school and the medical school who are making a go of the, their engineering research. Three points, possibilities, potential, and problems are a lot of what, we, what I spend my time thinking about. Um, a few years ago, the National Academy of Engineering in uh, Washington, D.C., in the United States, set up a series of grand challenges. They said, if we think about what happened 100 years ago, so you go back 100 years, you didn't have electrification, you didn't have a mass water system, you know, you can argue the Romans and the aqueducts, but there, there are a series of things that weren't in place then that happen in place now that have greatly improved the human experience. What are those challenges now for the next 100 years? Right? It's always easy to take a look back and figure out what the challenges were when you kind of see where we are. But some, projecting forward those challenges is extremely difficult. But you get together a bunch of great minds and you sort of say, if I were you now starting off your career, your research career, your educational career, what would I, what would I want to invest in? What do I think some of the big problems will be? How do I care, categorize categorize those in big uh, categories. Securing cyberspace was one. Advancing medicine with engineering, two. Discovering how the brain works, three. Developing renewable energy sources, understanding global climate change, alleviating the shortage of clean water. In fact, there are some that say more wars will be fought over access to clean water in the next 50 years than religion, politics, dollars, any other number of things. So the availability of clean water around the world is going clean potable water around the world is going to be something that we've got to challenge, we've got to tackle as an engineering community, a global engineering community. So we've looked at a couple of research fo foci, and we think how, that we are, have some ways that we can best meet these challenges. Uh, advanced materials and nanotechnology, it goes without saying. We talked a little bit about uh, Matthew and some of what he's doing for new surgical materials, how that could be used in drug delivery. Uh, so if you have a material that's a mesh and it, it, can, it, it, can, uh, it can be a semi-permeable membrane, maybe it's time dependent, you could think about slow release of, of drugs over a period of time, right? So instead of having to take something regularly, I take it and the, and the mechanism allows the release of the, the drug over the treatment or intervention over a period of time. Biological systems engineering. This is actually a really interesting area. When you think about how do we, 
how do we look at bio, you know, biology, the, the, the human existence as a system? Now, I, I do a lot of work in systems, so I like to think about systems as applied to uh, biology, as applied to medicine, as applied to policy. But thinking about biological systems actually presents very new and different ideas for what happens. So genetic circuits. Um, I sat through a biological systems lab, and if, if you look at it, in biological systems, it looks very much like my second year circuit lab when I was in an undergrad. You know, they've got mitochondrial powerhouses, they've got uh, circuits and switches. It feels very much like the work that I did, but this is in biology. And it's scary for me because I tried my hardest to stay away from biology. My wife is a wonderful OBGYN and, and, and basic scientist, so it's all around me, even now. Environmental engineering, sustainable technologies, imaging technologies and sig signal systems, networking and communication. These are all areas that we believe are research foci for being able to, to tackle some of our challenging problems. And we do that through a model that we call convergence. And I, I'd like to talk about convergence from a very uh, uh, high level, sort of a new paradigm in thinking about how do we look at interdisciplinary problems, and not just say, you as the civil engineers, go work on it and bring it in. You as the, the electrical engineers, go work on it and bring your uh, ideas. Environmental engineers, you come together. What if you were to say, here's a problem, here's an example. Across the way, in the, in the, uh, my colleagues from the medical school are presenting some ideas through a workshop. Last night over dinner, we had a chance to talk about uh, some of what's happening in, um, in the, with the, the placenta as a mechanism for exchanging materials between the, the mother and a child. So my colleague who's an uh, OBGYN and a molecular cell biologist says, so, Dedrick, what, how would you address this problem as an engineer? I said, so let me make sure I understand the problem. The first thing is set us up, understand what the analogies are. You have a semi-permeable membrane, and on that membrane there are different villi that control access to the, the, the material on either side. Yes. So he goes through and he describes what the material does and how the material responds. And I said, well, you know, we started to, to explain what my analogies were for what his, what his systems were. Before you know it, he says, I like what you just, I like what you just said about how the, the, the villus tree actually bathes the, the, um, the, the embryo umbilical cord with blood. Do you mind if I use it? I said, yeah. What I just gave you is an analogy that helps me as an engineer understand what you're telling me. But if we get those, if we get people together across disciplines, then we start to have your analogies make better sense to me. My analogies make better sense. I'm seeing things from a very different angle. And before you know it, we have something that's a, hopefully a stronger solution to the problem. And that's really the model that we try to, to work through in, uh, in, uh, at WashU. And we do that in some fantastic facilities. So over, we have a footprint that sort of spans, this is the campus, about a mile, a mile high and, and wide. We have a footprint that expands here, the older buildings, and here's a newer complex that's in place. All the buildings that you'll see here, uh, including the advanced facility for coal and energy research, um, fantastic space on campus, are fairly new. This is a student gathering space we built together to make sure that we have students being able to get together from dis different disciplines and have these kinds of conversations that we just talked about. This is the, the beginning of a new engineering complex. All of these buildings are less than 10 years old. These two buildings are less than five years old. This, two bu this building is less than two years old. In the course of the next 10 years, you'll see this additional part of the complex be built out. So it's a, a substantial investment in physical infrastructure to be able to house this philosophy that we've talked about. My office is here, my parking spot's right there. I like it, it's really nice. <laughs> so, great new lab spaces. Um, uh, this is sort of coming from the street, seeing the, the southmost entrance of the, of the building. This is, the, the, this is sunset in, at my office. If we think about what's happening with the engineering complex, this is the main building, this is what it will look like in the next 10 years. Right? So, a huge investment of, of space, 350,000 uh, square feet, it'll be 130 million dollar project over the time that it's all done. Um, but the idea here is not so much the physical space, but you need really good spaces in which to do good work. So our students, where are the places they've been? You heard us talk about McGee. Uh, Brisbane, Australia is where they spent the summer. They did some really, uh, really interesting work in, t in looking at energy and the environment uh, in Brisbane. But the summer before, they were here in Campinas uh, doing work with, uh, with uh, some of our colleagues here and that was a great experience. What we're trying to do now is say, how do we extend, expand that experience? So 
since joining, uh, taking my appointment at uh, Wash U. This is the first of my national uh, trips because I heard such great uh, feedback from their time in Campinas that I said, I've got to come and see uh, what's happening here. Programs. Study abroad, McDonald International Scholars Academy. I'm an ambassador at large in that academy. It's a focus of about 28 partners from a number of different places. You'll notice right, uh, let's see, where is, uh, this is uh, Unicamp. Um, at the, but this global network is really about trying to, trying to bring together some of the best minds on some of the most challenging problems. We've been to a few different places. I told you about, we came here in, in 2012. Uh, the summer, about 10, 12 students come. We have a regular annual, uh, biannual conference that uh, brings together hundreds of people uh, around the topic. Um, we have looked at coal in Mumbai, uh, Seoul. It, we did energy and nanotechnology. We talked about air quality. Uh, we've looked at urban uh, renewal, environmental issues in uh, Hong Kong. Um, our goal really is, as we said, to sort of go to places and examine the problems in, in an environment that's really conducive of, of of good conversation and great in information exchange. Our, 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 undergraduates, our undergraduates do undergraduate design projects and research in a number of different areas. I don't know how involved our undergraduates are here in research. I come from a tradition of undergraduates. My first research experience was a, as a first semester freshman when I was at MIT. And it's where you get hooked. You start, I'll tell you a quick story. I was asked to do some work. I was an electrical engineer computer scientist. I was going to be. And I was asked to do some work in uh, ocean. And I thought this was a trick to get me to be an ocean engineer. There was no way that I wanted to be an ocean engineer. What I realized is that they needed someone with my skill set to examine a problem that was happening in ocean engineering. It was around um, the monitoring of ships. There was a circuit that they didn't understand. They needed me to figure out the research on. That experience led to my first um, job, my first summer job. Someone called me up and they said, we see that you've done this experience in ocean engineering, which I did not want to do. I did it begrudgingly. And, I, and we have a problem that we think is analogous. They had server farms around the country, and they were having issues where the servers, the computer servers were overheating. They needed to be able to monitor those from a central location. And I said, wow, that's a simple, that's a simple extension of the problem that I solved in Shipmore. Uh, and here's what I, here's, here are the issues that I have. I need to find some way to connect. And I said, oh, we found a technology from a small company. Before you know it, we were able to deploy this technology in a couple different areas, including Disney, Coca-Cola, and, um, uh, and Walmart. Discoveries competition. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but to say our goal is to really focus on helping the students understand how to use and apply the knowledge they, that, they, that they develop for application, and perhaps even in a commercial environment. Uh, we started a competition of a $25,000 innovative ideas competition of which uh, Abigail and Andrew, I told you earlier, they started the Spiro Labs, Spiro Labs company. They were the winners last year. But that's not all we're doing in entrepreneurship. We're doing work with mentoring. We have a, a, a partnership with the Scandalara Center. We really are focusing on helping our students to ask the why questions and apply their answers to the benefit of society. Um, one other uh, company that I'll talk to you a little bit about is a company called LumaCare that came in second in our Discovery Ideas competition. What happens often is that uh, as a, a child, a newborn who's jaundiced, um, the, you know, these, they're really expensive techniques for trying to, to, to get the baby back to health. And usually it involves some time in an incubator or a, a pretty expensive piece of equipment that you take in some treatment facility. But the parent early on wants to have the child with them as quickly as possible. So what this company, what this uh, set of students did, undergraduates, is design a, a, a blanket, a uh, Billy blanket, but Lumacare is how they came up with. And it uses electroluminescence to treat jaundice in a very inexpensive way so that the mother can take their baby home much earlier and actually have the treatment happen at their home. They just won uh, a World Health World Health Organization design competition for this. They came in second place in our competition. So all of what I've told you today was just to lay the groundwork for saying that we hope, we believe engineering is a universal, universal degree. Can you imagine what would happen if the best lawyers, the best doctors, the best politicians had a first degree in engineering? All right, there's something about the rigor of engineering, not to mention the, first, the best engineers and scientists building their engineering careers to go on. I actually had a, a student from Unicamp who uh, I talked to over uh, lunch the other day, and he's, 
He's a computer engineering student from here who's getting a PhD in physics at WashU. I said, so this is interesting. Tell me about your transition. He said, well, it's an odd transition, but I really enjoyed my time studying computer engineering, and I, I wandered onto a discussion forum, and I really liked the ideas, the concept of physics, so I decided I'd like to do graduate work in physics. That shows you what can happen with a first degree in engineering, right? It'd be great if he went on to do a PhD in computer engineering, but it's fantastic that we're going to have a great particle physicist who's got a first background, first degree in engineering. That tells you, in my mind, the flexibility and universality of that degree. Uh, a lot of what I focus, what I'm hoping to focus on now is, is thinking about um, why we have a number of students uh, who have come from UNICAMP to do uh, uh, doctoral work. It's fantastic. I'd like to see more, of, more students engaged in thinking about spending some time on campus doing master's level work. And I'll tell you why that's, that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me because the, the PhD is a long, a long path. And sometimes there are concerns, things happen you know, when, over a, a four, five, seven, eight year period that may make it difficult to be away from that, for that long. If there are people that are interested in PhD work or research or visiting time, I'm not at all trying to discourage you. I love, we'd, we'd welcome uh, you to, to come think about it. The, but the, the master's program, master's programs are a shorter period, an immersion in research, and a basis on which to build a number of things. After, you know, I sort of went through and I, I counsel students often who finish their, their undergraduate degrees and say, I don't know what I want to do. A PhD is not a place to find yourself. Right? So if you don't know what you want to do, you don't, I wouldn't recommend starting it. Now that's me speaking, not, maybe you have a different idea here. It's not, it's not a really good place to find yourself. A master's program is an opportunity for you to say, so am I, am I actually going to go to industry? Am I actually going to continue my research and go and do uh, a PhD? Am I going to try for a tenure track position? Am I going to try for a differentiated position in industry? Do I want to be an expert in some area? Do I want? So it, it, it sort of branches off and opens up doors, um, but it often allows you people who are on the fence, whether or not they like research, to try some more of it and do it in, a, in a, a, really, a really supportive environment. So I'm a big supporter of thinking about uh, these kinds of concepts as you think, as try to decide where you want to take your career. I'm going to end with uh, two slides. The first is a, a slide that I often use when we think about the spectrum of development. So I've talked to you a lot about this discovery process. Um, uh, when I was with the government, I spent some time with the National Science Foundation. I spent some time working on a, a program called i -Corps, Innovation Corps. And that was saying, we, we invest lots of money in basic research and discovery. But some of that gets caught in my term, the ditch of death, right? So it's in a lab, it never gets out. Okay. How do we fix that? Yes, sir. On the last slide. Yes. What's the difference between an MS, an edge, and an Yes, so a great, great point. So the, the MS is sort of the traditional master of science, uh, usually thesis-based. Uh, you, you're going to have some research component. The ME may not be. So the Master of Engineering in Robotics is usually designed as someone who is saying, I want to do more work, maybe even a hands-on project, and then I want to go out into the field. Uh, that's also true of the Master of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering and in Computer Science. Now, let me, let me say that that's not true across the US, the U.S. My master's degree from MIT is a Master of Engineering um, because of the way students are admitted. That happens to be the way uh, WashU differentiates. Fair? So, the Master of Science, traditional research masters, the Master of Engineering, often at uh, WashU means that there, you really are thinking less that you want to go towards in the path of the PhD, but more that you want to do something that's more of an industry-focused project. Not always, right? We, there, there can be exceptions to that. Uh, and the ME just means uh, I shortened Master of Engineering and did not write it out. So thank you for pointing out my error. I appreciate that. <laughs> it means that you haven't fallen asleep, which is, which is good. Um, so, so the, the, this term, the ditch of death, is about how do you get things out of this, this sort of gap where it, it's in the lab, it's a great useful technology, but we've we got to move it somewhere. It's gotta, how, do we, how do we give it a chance to die in the valley of death? Right? Because entrepreneurship is tough. And, and I don't want you to think I'm preaching entrepreneurship, but I want you to think about how you learn and develop, which normally happens here, and how that may play itself out over the course of a career. Um, so we, we think a lot about this path and how to make sure that great innovation do not just die here, but they have a chance to sort of make it. You know? And there are other interventions that happen here, but we were focused specifically on getting things out of the laboratory and giving them an idea. Things like the discoveries competition that I talked about help that. 
So if you take nothing else away from this, take away my, my thoughts on uh, the, the entrepreneurial spiral. So I believe that we try very hard to, to have encouraged inquiry. That is, remember early on we talked about what is the engineer, it's the person that asks the why questions. So we try very hard to in, have encouraged inquiry. We try very hard to find, oh, and, and if this is foreign to you, I use system dynamics a lot, so these are systems dynamics causal loop diagrams that can get pretty crazy, but this is, a pretty, this is about as simple as you get in terms of a causal loop diagram. Uh, a willingness to take risk, calculated risk. So thinking about, there's a 90% chance I want to do this, there's a 70, so thinking about what the probabilities are, thinking about what the paths are, you're asking the why questions, and Robert Frost of, the, of New England has this poem called The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. You're the traveler at an, an impasse, and you can go le right or left. Where do you want to go? Calculate what you think is down each one of those. You can do Bayesian probability trees if you like, and you come back with something that says the value here is the path I want to go down. For computer scientists, you know them as bound and branch problems. Um, for those of you in environmental engineering, you're doing them as, as risk analysis. But it really is how do I calculate the risk and move in a direction? Learn resiliency. This is not do you always land on your feet. Can you fail quickly and rebound? Uh, at MIT, we used to call them uh, Barton types. There are students that know how to fail and they get up really quickly. Uh, one of my really good colleagues said, Dedrick, you always land on your feet. I said, no, I just get up really, really fast. Right? So this learned resiliency is extremely important. And that helps you to have a, a developed flexibility and adaptability. So when you know that you can rebound pretty quickly and you're okay with taking the calculated risk, you know if you, can, if you take the risk and you fail that you're going to rebound, it adds a sense of flexibility and adaptability to you. And that encourages you to do more of asking the why question. So it's, a, it's a, actually a... I call it a virtuous cycle. If you don't do it, you can spiral in the other direction. It becomes a vicious cycle. So I encourage you all to think about, you know, engineering at WashU, I've tried to give you sort of an, or an overview of some of the things that, and the philosophies that we have as, a, as an institution, uh, give you an idea of the kind of people, the places, and the programs that are there. Um, if there are any questions, comments, I'll even take complaints and corrections, clearly. Thoughts? Did I go too fast? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a, well, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. My pleasure. Nice. Um, related to the financing, you, know, uh, mm -hmm. you have a, uh, you have mentioned the, the, the events, the, the, the um, uh, mm -hmm. initiatives. Who the participants? So uh, that varies. Um, usually, that's the institution will c cover the expense of the uh, their participants for yeah. So, but it, it really varies. It varies on where the event is happening, and where it's you know where it's occurring, um, what we're trying to achieve there, um, and uh, how much of a draw that that place will be, how much of a convening spot that place is. And by that I mean what are the what are the Attractions is not the right word, but what are the, the, what are the components of that site that really add to the topic that we're discussing uh, at hand? Uh, and and sometimes, this sometimes this is kind of a, a process where the site helps us to figure out the components, you know, what the topic will be. Other times, the topic helps us to figure out where the site will be. So another, it really depends. Another quick question, uh, maybe not too quick, I don't know, uh, about uh, carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. I remember I participated, I had So, so, so let me let me 
let me say I think it is there. So we talked about understanding global climate and change. And if we think about what we are looking at as ways to focus it, we do talk about energy, environment, sustainable technologies, where sequestration is there. So it is one of those grand, grand challenges. And we do believe that we've got a research focus around it. Yeah. But it, and, and it's extremely important. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. It was the second place in the competition. The first place was the Sparrow Labs that I told you about earlier, the, the spirometer that was designed for the developing world. Uh, and they're doing really well. So, so both of these students, on my slide here, both of these students are doing extremely well. Um, Lumacare, uh, it, it really was a set of students that said, they started off with the wrong tech, what I would probably say is the wrong technology, but a really good idea. And in the course of going through the, the, the uh, competition, they actually were able to find better technology and develop this blanket. It's really low cost treatment for jaundice. What is jaundice? Jaundice is when the baby comes out a little yellow. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a sort of a skin disorder. Yeah, and uh, it's, it happens in newborns. And there is a treatment, it's a known treatment. It's usually exposure to some sort of light for a period of time. But you know, it, people say in the early, age, early days of, of a, a child being born is most the and most important time to bond with the mother and the, with the parents. So if you've got them under some incubator for a while unnecessarily, then it takes away from that bond. And this was to say, how do we develop something that's low cost, that you can buy these for a, a few thousand dollars if you want to, but how do we find something that's less of that cost, maybe half of that or a fraction of that, that would allow a parent to take their baby home and treat them? Um, so yeah, they developed this, this prototype and uh, I mean, the, the exciting part about this, and they actually use inexpensive fiber optics. So the, the exciting part about this is you see students that are ident identifying a problem and saying, let's try it. And I will say, even, even the third and fourth place teams, uh, the third and fourth place teams were freshmen who decided to try their hand at this. And there's a lot that they needed to learn, but I was really proud of those teams because they said, so you asked them the question, you know, how did it work? And I've been, in some instances, it didn't work. But you ask them, would you do it again? And it was, yes, absolutely, I'd do it again because I know what I did wrong. You know, we should have gone here, we should have done that, we should have started earlier. So there was some learning there. And in, in, my, in my virtuous cycle that I describe here, they, they started to develop more of this, this learn resiliency. And then the next time they ask those why questions, they will build this on a more flexible and adaptable model of, of the world. I think building up models, breaking them, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Building up models and breaking them down and then turning that learning back into asking the why questions is what makes us better engineers. Yes, sir. Yeah, so there, so there are a couple things. You should make sure that you send me an email <laughs> for, as a first, because I, I, I'd love to see that. Let me know a little bit more about, about you. And actually, go to our website, engineering.wessel.edu, and look in greater depth at some of the programs that are there, some of the professors of the research, and say, is this, is this a fit for me? You know, is this the kind of thing that I love to do? Am I excited about doing it? Um, we, as I said, we do have a, a few alumni of Unicamp that are on campus now doing all sorts of things, um, which makes me even more excited to come and meet some of you, some of the students here, because you, if you have great colleagues to go ahead of you, it makes us even more excited to see you know, who else is, is, is in the audience. And you've got some fantastic colleagues that preceded you. Yeah. Other questions? Where do your alumni students, they, they go? Where is there, if you look at the geographically, and also areas, where, where do they work and what do they do? Yeah, so, so a great, great question. Um, where do our, I just killed my presentation, but, where do our alumni go and what do they do? Um, so if I, if I were to pull up my world slide, you'd be able to see that they go all over. They're all over the world. Um, the things they do, you know, that we have, we, have alumni we have alumni in engineering that have gone on to business. They've gone on to law. They've gone on to medicine. They've stayed in engineering. The, uh, they founded major, uh, uh, major companies. Uh, if you look at, at, at Stanford's... Uh, Stanford's uh, Vice Chancellor for uh, Translational Technologies is a, is a WashU alum. Um, if you look at this, the Silicon Valley, if you look at 
uh, D.C., Chicago, full of WashU alumni. But if you go outside of the U.S. and you look at, uh, I'll tell you a story. I was in Australia um, uh, maybe about six or seven months ago now. So I, I went down as a part of a distinguished visitor delegation to uh, Antarctica. And on my trip back, I came through Australia and I came through New Zealand. And I was talking to the, the folks who were leading the New, New Zealand camp, uh, Scott uh, Base, on, uh, on uh, the continent of Antarctica. And so we were invited over as, as you know, distinguished scientific guests to their, their home. And I started to talk to a woman. And she says, well, my daughter studied in the US. And I said, that's great. Where did she study? She says, well, she started off at Washington University. And I had to laugh because I had just accepted my appointment to watch you. And I told her, I couldn't have paid you to, to, to say more. But it was an engineering, biomedical engineering student who had gone on to do law, uh, gone on to do medicine in Australia, uh, originally from Australia. And that's just an anecdote, anecdote to say we are definitely a global institution with ideas and a mindset on becoming more global. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, um, it, you're doing great things in a number of, of, of fantastic areas. A lot of our, our students are very interested in the intersection of law. On, um, preparing people to occupy, to, to become leaders or to become uh, positioned in government, in society, and to play an yes. important role in the leadership in this. Yeah. So, so I told you, I showed you the slide from my first class. I sat in here somewhere to remember where I put it. But the, the four rules that I start off with are rules that I show at the beginning of my, uh, my class. And that class is called Engineering Thought, the role of scientists, engineers, and technologists in, in the innovative process, policy formation. So we look at policies. We apply systems dynamics to examine latent transformations in policies. Um, you can so see feedback loops. You can see um, delays and how those impact delays. And this is the same as if you were building uh, feedback circuits in intellectual engineering. Um, J Forster sort of techniques to say, why did, we, why did this happen? Why did this, this late transformation of a policy happen? Well, it was a shortcut. It was obvious when you built the system. Uh, it was obvious when you put the technology in place. Uh, so our goal is to try to get students to think differently using their, uh, their engineering talent. Uh, either apply directly in the field of research or a practice of engineering, or apply it as practitioners uh, in, in a budding or adjacent industry, such as medicine, law, business. I'll say again, the, the engineering degree is a first degree. I'm a huge proponent of this. as a first degree, a first way of thinking and training oneself. Uh, I think it's hard to put a price tag on that. There's a, there's a way of, I mean, my colleague in front of me can smile and know that and, and all of you who are now going through this, sometimes you'll ask yourself, why did I pick this? Right? I know there were times that I would sit in my dorm room and say, my friends are out having a fantastic time. Why is it that I'm taking differential equations and, and circuit analysis? And when I got to my most difficult situation uh, in uh, we're evalu evaluating a global policy uh, in the National Science Foundation, I found myself thinking about a circuits and systems class from my sophomore year in my engineering program. And thinking through some very rudimentary techniques in terms of circuits, some very powerful techniques in terms of systems. Right? So you will find that if you do well and focus well on absolutely soaking up what is your, the you know, core of an engineering education, it will serve you well in any capacity. And I fundamentally believe that. Other questions? Email is uh, just first name is just Dedrick at MIT at uh, West Warren. Wrong, wrong place. So one second. The last slide. Other questions? Wow, more slides than I thought here. There we go. We have about uh, 100 few more people watching us. All right. you by the internet. Hello. I wish I'd known that. <laughs> Fortunately, we, I don't think we can uh, get questions from them. But yeah. anyway. But, well, uh, well, feel free for those of you who are watching who aren't here. Um, that's great. It just it extends the reach of, of what we're trying to do in, in the visit here. 
my email is up here, Dedrick at Wessel.edu. If I'm overwhelmed, I will respond. It might take me a little while. But I, I do encourage you, if you've got questions, if you are interested in the things we talked about, this is a very important partnership for us. Um, and uh, the reason that we're spending a few days here is because, as I said, great colleagues have come before you, and we'd love to see that, uh, that, that pipeline continue. And we'd love to do great research with you here. Thank you very much, great. Professor Geis. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.